Well, thank you very much. That was doubly humbling. And first of all, after that beautiful performance, very self-conscious about my voice. It is not Ibo going to be as beautiful as that. And secondly, that was a beautiful introduction. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I'm here today uh, because I wonder, and I've been wondering for a long time, why the cities we live in look the way they do. Why is it that some ideas, from technologies to just bright ideas, take a hold of our imaginations and then change the way we live for the next decades and generations? Now, over the last years, I've had the fortune to travel around the world and do research in various places and uh, study this phenomenon and try to understand better what it is that, as an urban designer and architect, I'm participating in. Um, now, this picture was taken in Venezuela three years ago, and it was a city that always has left uh, an extreme impression on me for what well, this image clearly shows. But it is not only that it is a city of extreme density, it is a city in the midst of an extreme natural violence of earthquakes, landslides, and floods and at the same time of the most jaw-dropping, striking socio-economic disparities, with people living in absolute uh, fear and danger of nature, and at the same time, extreme prosperity. Now, our research there was looking at uh, natural disasters, and while there were many lessons that we learned, I, one of the most kind of foundational things was what I learned, was that while I was trained to design museums and libraries, it was infrastructure that was constantly the first choice. It's the first choice how we establish our position vis-a-vis -vis nature, that we see what we want to do with the ground and the place that we are well presented with. So this was uh, in Venezuela, and the irony was that the land, the flat land on which you see the city, was the, process, was the product of a process of erosion that created flat land. And so the same process that made the city possible, years later destroyed it and eliminated you know, many people, many, a lot of property. So when they were rebuilding the city, the first question was, how do we deal with that element? So for me, infrastructure became like this extremely important element to start understanding place, but especially the relationship between the cities that we make and the earth as we find it. Now, on the one hand, that's a story about locality and about very specific conditions on site. On the other hand, we see this. We see a globe, and we see the astonishing thing that infrastructure has also done, and that is connect every single city in the world into what is now the endless city, the cosmopolis, once an ideal of Asian Greeks. But is it that? Is it this division of finally a connected humanity on one Earth? Or is it a, an image of the pending apocalypse? Is it an image of an, a system of urbanization that has run astray, that is formed and grows by processes that we actually do not manage anymore and do not have in hand? So for me, this kind of striking difference between infrastructure being in hyper-local condition, and on the other hand, the stuff that makes our world, brings it together, has, has spurred my you know, fascination for the last years. Now, when we think of this, when we think of cities, we rarely see this image. And this is the stuff that makes that global city possible. This is the stuff that I wasn't trained to deal with, because we had to make museums. But it's the stuff that just when you see, it's just jaw-dropping. This is what makes it possible that you can buy $1 ice cream, which was imported from China for some reason. This is what makes it possible that we negotiate extremely weird geographies and try to standardize them so that we can get what is, I think, a very singly defined um, value, and then we create the Earth according to that value, which is profit maximization. Now, one of the big problems is, is that the Earth simply is not that way. The Earth is an infinitely dynamic and a system which, you know, people try to comprehend. There are models that model whatever type of ecological system. But the thing is, there's beautiful maps. This is the Mississippi River and how it's been changing over the last hundreds of years. But there's this, 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 this tension, and this tension between our desires to have prosperity and to go to the other side of the world in very few seconds, and at the same time, this growing understanding, which has been voiced by my previous speakers, that we might not be able, we're not dealing that well with this condition. 
Now, historically, we've been doing this since the moment that we actually started treating the ground. It has been always in the, in the image of the conquest of nature. We defined our countries, our pride, through constraining nature and showing that we, people, countries, different social groups, were able to do that by overcoming nature. Now, some of that has produced beautiful things. It has made cities possible in places where otherwise there wouldn't have been cities because it brought water from afar. It has created energy at places where there was no energy, but it has created cultures in a fight against the ocean. We, as the Dutch, have extremely benefited from a kind of unity and a feeling in our fight against the sea. Yet, we don't that often contemplate what it is to work with the sea. And a few years ago, or I, no, this is not a few years ago, this is last year, uh, I was in Japan, and you might recognize this image, is that when these systems of denial, these systems that say nature is not what we work with, nature is what we fight, when they utterly fail. And this is when a tsunami came, and this is what the city more or less looked like in a scheme, as it had tsunami barriers. <clears throat> the city was built in a way that big concrete barriers would stop tsunamis, and they built the cities behind them. Now, when we came here, we were working together with local uh, communities, with regional authorities, and instead of finding an extreme hostility towards nature, they were very disappointed. They were disappointed for two reasons. One, their ancestors had lined the coast of Japan with big uh, blocks which said, don't build in the flat lands. Very simple. And they had denied that message, built infrastructure, and ultimately built there. And on the other hand, they had come to understand that they were so out of sync with the more kind of mythical understanding of nature that they really wanted to rebuild back in a way that was in, in, more in sync. So we started looking at a different model, which we borrowed from France, because we found out that oysters are produced in many regions, also in the Netherlands, but that they import their seeds, oyster spat, from here. But because there wasn't any flat land, they imported, and then they tenfold 20-fold the price here. So we were telling them, now you have the chance to just do this at home, take all the profit, and at the same time, build an urbanization, a form of, of, of economic occupation which creates old value, but that is intrinsically tied to a natural system. That when you treat the natural system wrong, it feeds back and destroys your prosperity. And what this kind of creates is a new understanding that we can build infrastructures that don't deny nature, but fundamentally work together with it for prosperity, but also for a more common goal. So these are these fields in, in, uh, in France that work. They make, I don't know, $1,000 oysters. Anyhow, they import it from Japan. Uh, but this, why is this relevant? I went all over the world looking at these places, and it was actually not intentional when I found out that something was going on back home. Now, this image is in Europe without borders and what we've built so far. This is our cities, and they, in the next few years, they are going to be connected. There is a European initiative, the Trans-European Networks, which will invest 1.7 trillion euros in the next years of public money in the integration of our common infrastructure. Now, the benefits, while we have an imperfect political system, while there is a lot of falling apart around the economic crisis, etc. There's very few people who are actually opposing the further physical integration of Europe. Now, because everyone kind of supports this, there hasn't been any question. How many people knew about this in this room? Wow, no one. Well, that's a problem. This is the new deal of Europe. This is what nations used to build their pride out of. And now it's secret. For me, that was the reason to come home and get to work. And one of the interesting things is, is that when you look at uh, cities, they are actually already tied to ecological systems. When you look at all the big European cities, they are all connected to rivers. They are all linked or at the intersection of rivers and roads. Now, that seems like extremely logical, but they are all built on the same system of denial. They took the river, they, they totally impacted it, and then they built a city around it in denying its normal system, its flow, its ever-curving form. And the interesting thing is that these rivers, they form watersheds. And it's kind of when you look at Europe like this, you see a new Europe emerging, a new Europe that works on a logic which is more in sync with hydrologic, geologic systems, with the ecology, but 
It doesn't look like the Europe we so much fight about, about the Greeks spending too much money or the Dutch, I don't know what we do wrong. What do we do wrong? We must be doing something wrong. Anyhow, it is this, this image that, that inspired me. And then when I found out that in 1992, these two rivers were connected, the Rhine and the Danube. They form an artery from the east to the west. They form a connection between Rotterdam, around the corner here, to Costanza and Bucharest. They form what could be one big extrusion of concrete to put ships through, or they can be a new way of thinking about infrastructure. Now, the undeniable symbolic impact of this, of this connection has already been a, has been a tool in order to get people together, policymakers, engineers, to start rethinking if we can build Europe not on the premise of infinite growth, infinite prosperity, but on a new consciousness, a new consciousness that we want to make, a, a set the, the foundation, that we want to build the bottom layer for our future city, but also for our future generations to be able to make a sustainable city. And while all our efforts will be needed in various places on volunteering on other initiatives, it starts with infrastructure. And the fact that no one knows about this, we have to get busy and start demanding that this infrastructure will become and will look like what we aspire and what we hope, and that we ultimately end up with a real European infrastructure for a sustainable future. Thank you very much.